We are, um, we are now going to be welcoming uh, the author of, of this wonderful novel. We've, we've, we've had a robust conversation about American Dirt uh, with participants sharing their very visceral reactions of the migrant experience from reading this book. And, and uh, Janine, we're really honored and thrilled that you're joining us um, tonight. Uh, Janine is the author of the novels The Outside Boy and The Crooked Branch and also of the best-selling memoir, A Rip in Heaven. And I understand Janine lives in New York with her husband and two children. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, as you know, in this portion of our book club, um, you all are, are muted now. And uh, Dr. Ayaya Martinez will be asking Ms. Cummins um, your questions in this portion. So, um, uh, Monica, I'm, I'm going to you know, send this back to you and just welcome Janine. Thank you. Yes, I would have to echo what you just said. We are really fortunate and uh, thankful uh, to have uh, Janine Cummins join us as uh, the author of the book. Uh, we have received some really um, interesting questions from several of you. And um, what I tried to do was to put them together in two main groups, two main categories. There were some questions that were kind of broad questions that had to do with the research process, with the writing process, with literature and writing literature. And then there was a group of questions that had to do with more specific elements in the novel. So I'm going to start by um, going over um, and inviting Janine to help us with these questions that are general questions about her writing process and her experience writing literature. Uh, the first of those questions says this. I would love to hear more about your process for this novel. Can you talk about the research you did and how it impacted your writing? In the research you did for the book, what was the most frightful thing you learned? Um, that is the fundamental question. I thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming this evening. I, it was a lovely invitation. I'm really happy to be here and thank you for reading my novel. Um, it took me five years to write this book and the research really was everything. So I began in 2013, well before the current presidential administration, well before even, you know, talk about building a wall really entered the national zeitgeist in the way it has now. Um, I spent the first three and a half years writing two really terrible drafts of this novel that I subsequently threw out. Um, but in between writing those drafts, I went to Mexico. I spent time in the borderlands. I, I visited Casas de Migrante. Um, I, I visited orphanages. I volunteered at a desayunador in Mexico, um, a soup kitchen for migrants. I, um, I visited with everyone who I could think of visiting. I talked to scholars, um, humanitarian aid workers, lawyers who were working to represent unaccompanied children, um, people who were documenting human rights abuses on both sides of the border. And of course, I talked with many, many migrants themselves in various stages of their, their journey. Um, and, you know, in between making those trips to Mexico and meeting all of those remarkable people, I also did a lot of reading. And the one thing I think that struck me early on in the research process was the gulf of understanding between my brain and my heart. So that when I thought I had learned and I had a good sense sort of academically in my brain um, what to expect, then I would go there. And when you witness with your own eyes the thing that you've read about 15 times previously, when you're there and you see it and you meet the people who are enduring um, what many of these people are enduring. It was a very different kind of experience. Um, I heard someone use the word visceral to describe their reactions, I think, to reading the book. And that was very much my experience in the, 
in the research that, um, for example, you know, reading about La Bestia, doing all the research about the train, I understood with my brain um, that, you know, people are falling off of this train every single day, being maimed and killed. I knew that with my brain. Um, but when I was in Mexico, one of the first days that I visited a migrant shelter, a young man came in from Honduras, 22 years old, who had lost his leg just three days before. Um, and really just meeting him and seeing, um, I think meeting him so soon after that experience and seeing that he was still in a moment of his life where he was really trying to grapple with the reality of his new situation. Um, that was a very different experience than reading about it or watching documentaries about it. And I think it, it was that kind of thing over and over again, I think that informed my writing. Great, thank you. Another question we have is the following. The publication of American Dirt has drawn clearly contrasting reactions. On one hand, there have been questions about the way in which this marginalized group of migrants is described in the novel. On the other hand, readers have also described how they felt a visceral understanding of migrants' fear and desperation. Mm -hmm. Why do you think there is such a polarized reaction to your novel? Um, I, I wish I knew, but I, I think that a lot of, I think that a lot of what happened in the days immediately surrounding the publication, um, you know, I think the cry that went up was a sound of woundedness. And it took me a while to sort of accept that because I felt quite um, bereft myself um, by the by the reaction that the book stirred up um, because it was always my intention to contribute a story um, not to define the story and as a writer as a woman um, I have long been aware of the inequities in the publishing industry. I worked in publishing for 10 years. I happen to be part Puerto Rican. Um, I am well aware of how underrepresented and underpaid Latino writers tend to be in this industry. Um, and I think there was a very legitimate feeling that for a very long time, their voices have been ignored. And then along comes me and I wrote this book and it got all this hoopla. And um, I think there was a lot of, you know, a lot of pain surrounding that. There were, there were also some like really just hardcore legitimate um, um, misunderstandings about who I am as a person. And I think what the book was initially, I think that, you know, the fact that the, the reaction came so quickly, um, um, before really before the book even was published was some indication that a lot of the reaction was coming from people who hadn't yet had the opportunity to, to read the book. And, um, you know, I'm really gratified now, 17 weeks on or 18 weeks on, um, to see the, the shifting sort of response to the book and to hear from so many readers who, you know, who feel good about it and feel that they learned something or that their eyes were opened or that just that they had a good experience of reading a novel. And, um, you know, I, I'm trying, you know, I try to hold on to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, Laura Groff in her New York Times review wrote, Cummins' stated intention is not to speak for migrants, but to speak while standing next to them. 
loudly enough to be heard by people who don't want to hear. Yeah. What do you think she meant by this? You know, I didn't read the reviews, um, but so every time someone quotes a review at me, I'm a little like, uh, do I really want to hear this? Um, but that sounded pretty um, reasonable. And so, um, you know, I mean, that was my intention. That was always my hope. I believe, um, actually, I, I really strongly believe that in this country, we have a moral obligation to be engaged with this story. And I think it's all too easy nowadays to turn a blind eye to it. There is so much sort of polarizing vitriol on both sides of this issue um, that I think a lot of reasonable, thoughtful people just sort of go like, no thanks, I don't really want any part of that. And it's easy to, to not engage. And I have a feeling that, um, you know, when I started writing the book, it sounds crazy now, but I think that, um, you know, although it's clear that, that Lydia and Luca are Mexican, Rebecca and Soledad are Central American, the idea for me in writing this book was that they could be anyone. In fact, they could be Syrian or they could be from Paradise, California. They could be from any fragile place that begins to collapse around them. And for me as a writer, as a mother, the idea was what would you do to save your child if you found yourself in that position as so many people around the world from different cultures and different countries now find themselves in that position more and more often. And I think that is a a question that all of us should ask ourselves when we live um, when we live in relative comfort and relative privilege and we have a government who is um, really uh, treating migrants in a way that feels just completely inhumane. I feel like there is always room on the bookshelf for one more voice saying, come on, let's pay attention to this story. Please, let's get engaged with this story. Let's imagine ourselves, you know, in that position. I feel like as a novelist, the whole endeavor of writing a work of fiction, an act of imagination, is that I endeavor to um, imagine myself into someone else's circumstances. And in the writing of this novel, those circumstances felt to me like um, a situation that we could all use a little more engagement in. We should all be thinking a little more deeply about, I think. Since time is running faster than we hmm. always want, I'm going to jump to one last of these general questions that I think you've began to touch as, as you were answering the previous one. Um, how has the publication of your book and the controversy from the Latinx community opened up new channels of opportunity for Hispanic authors? Do you think it has done that somehow? I do. I think it is. it has already opened up that conversation. Um, and it's long overdue, you know, it's been a long simmering point of contention in the publishing world. And I see action on the part of several publishers um, attempting to answer this real gap in the industry. Um, and I will say, I think that one thing that, um, one point of many where there was a, a, an even bigger gap in understanding, I think, previous to this moment. Um, I live on the East Coast. 99% of publishing happens on the East Coast. Um, the vast majority of Latino communities here on the East Coast are Caribbean Latinos, or we have a lot of Central American Salvadorians. Um, there, there are pockets of Mexican communities as well, but um, there are much, much, much bigger Mexican and Chicano communities in the west of the country um, and in the south and in the southwest. And I think there was 
there was and is a particular absence of Mexican and Chicano voices, even more so than um, Caribbean Latinos, you know? So that is a very sort of specific issue that publishing needs to address. And I have seen um, at Macmillan specifically and at some of the other publishers as well, a real earnest um, effort to try to address that, the absence of those voices from their lists. So look, I will say, I very much wish that my book had not been in the crosshairs of this controversy. I wish that I hadn't been the catalyst for this conversation, but on the other hand, I'm really glad the conversation is happening. I think it's, it's incredibly important. And I said to my husband before the book was published, you know, if there is a chance that, um, that this book will open up someone's heart or mind, then I'm, I'm willing to take it on the chin. And now the big joke in my family is like, we really underestimated what it would look like to take it on the chin um, because we really had no idea really how, how big that um, controversy would end up being. But I am gratified that I feel like there is a possibility for real positive change in the publishing world because of these conversations now happening. Great. Well, now let's go to more specific elements in, in the novel. Okay. I have a question that says, Javier is full of contradictions. He is ruthless and, and smart, yet he presents himself to Lydia as merely a gentle intellectual. Mm -hmm. He is vengeful against Lydia's family, yet it seems he still has a soft spot for Lydia herself. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why you wrote this ca his character the way you did? What do you think his relationship with Lydia really meant to him? Well, I think he was absolutely in love with her. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the many things that I hoped to do, one of the things I think I always want to do as a writer is to sort of pick at the scab of the, of the stereotype, frankly. And um, there are so many books and stories and movies about narcotraficantes. And in most of these stories, they look very familiar. Um, and I wanted to um, interrogate that stereotype and dig a little deeper. I mean, clearly he is a mass murderer. So, um, you know, you can only go so far with your empathy for him, but I wanted him to be a real person. I didn't want him to be a sort of one note, easy villain. Um, and the same goes for Lorenzo. I wanted both of them to have um, a story that was more complicated than a typical narco. I wanted them to be more fully developed human beings with um, you know, reasons for ending up where they ended up. And, um, you know, so one of the tricks that I did with the, um, the Javier character was that I sort of based, not him specifically, but the, the relationship, the dynamic was based on a friendship from my own life um, that I was interested in, a very intense and difficult friendship that I wanted to explore a little bit more. So that's, um, you know, writers, it's cheaper than paying a therapist. You can just work it out on the page sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a follow-up question, early in the novel, Lydia develops an emotional relationship with Javier. Yeah. Yet she has a happy relationship with her husband. Mm -hmm. Talk about the early dynamics of these two relationships for Lydia and maybe its impact on the plot. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. You know, I think this, um, I, I am a married woman. Of, I have a very happy marriage. I have a wonderful husband. Um, and we have a very similar relationship to Lydia and Sebastian. Um, he is... I have quite a lot of liberty in my marriage and that makes me happy. I'm, I'm a free person. 
Um, I'm also completely monogamous and devoted to my husband, I should be clear. But, um, you know, when I was young, I did have this sense that like being married may involve uh, some, um, some forking over of my liberty that I would have to like, it's putting the cuffs on a little bit. And having a marriage where my husband trusts me implicitly and does not attempt to, um, you know, be involved in my friendships with other people, um, unless I invite him to be involved, is a, is a real, um, was a surprise to me as I became a married woman and a, a, a happy surprise. And, but the thing, and I think that many um, modern couples have that kind of marriage and it was different from the, the um, models that I saw in the generation before me. Um, but it comes with some like slippery, tricky dynamics. There are moments where you have to go, oh, wait a second, hang on. <laughs> I think you're getting the wrong idea here. And you have to know when to put the brakes on and build those boundaries and be quite um, aware that, that you know, there, are, um, there are possible pitfalls in, in your road if you're not careful. So I think that Lydia, sort of fell headlong into this friendship um, that made her feel very delighted and with someone she felt a, a real strong bond with. Um, and then she began to recognize that there were gonna be some red flags and she, you know, to her credit, I think to her credit, she sort of back, tried to walk it back. But of course, by that stage, um, the plot had been laid and you know, things were going to go the way they went unfortunately for Lydia. So it could have gone very differently. Yeah. Well, I have two more questions and I, I would like uh, to, um, you know, invite our audience to stay with us for, for a little longer to hear those two. One has to do with the novel in particular and the other one has to do with your projects, your future projects, your, your next book. So uh, the first one says, when Lydia and Luca finally cross the border, Lydia remarks that she didn't even notice they had done it. One might expect this would be one of the most important scenes since it was their goal all along. But in many cases, it's the moments along the way that are the emotional core. What would you say to that? I love that. I don't know which insightful reader in your group came up with that, but it, <laughs> you know, this, maybe it's a closet novelist somewhere in this group, but I think that um, very, very often in fiction, that is the way, you know, um, and I think in my, in my favorite novels, to be sure, that is the way, that the, the moment you expect to be the big moment is actually sort of um, a letdown because it, it goes by you without you noticing. And I, I think this is very, very often in real life, the way milestones happen. And sometimes, like if you blink, you missed it. And sometimes that is cause for tremendous feelings of anxiety or regret for me in my life. And I think for, for a lot of people, um, and maybe in giving that enlightenment to Lydia, I was also trying to reassure myself that you didn't actually miss it. Like you're still living it. This is the moment you're doing it. It's okay. And um, I think Lydia is just smarter than I am that she sort of was able to, in the moment, um, realize that it had gone past and yet adelante, she's okay. She will keep, she will keep going forward. Great. Um, we have um, one of the persons who joined us this, this afternoon would like to hear uh, from you about your next work, even if you, know, you don't have details about what that is about. It's yeah. more uh, the interest on how you're feeling about it and how do you go about your daily writing practice after all that has happened with American Dirt? Yeah, well, um, I don't feel good, I will say. I am not writing. Um, I 
I will at some point. I will write again. I have several ideas for what the next book might be. Um, I told someone before this book came out that I was thinking about writing my next novel set in Puerto Rico. And I still want to write that novel, but right now it feels like a suicide mission. I don't know if um, that would be a great move for me to write my next novel um, set in Puerto Rico. But on the other hand, you know, there are just so, there is such a, a vast number of horrific injustices being visited upon the island of Puerto Rico for generations now. And again, these are things that I believe are happening outside of our mainstream vision in this country. There looked like there was a moment after Hurricane Maria where we might be interested and then just closed the door and moved on. Um, those are the stories that move me. You know, I want to, those are always the stories that I'm interested in digging into and flipping over and looking at the underbelly and getting digging into that sort of injustice and and then also hopefully writing compelling characters and a page turning plot so that you you don't notice that you're hopefully learning to be outraged about something as you read. Um, that's always my hope as a writer, but I also feel worried right now that before I move on to any project, and I don't think I'll write the Puerto Rico book next, I, I'm not sure, um, but I think my first job as a writer right now will be to make sure that I manage somehow to preserve the sanctity of my own voice, that I am not um, going to write a novel into a place of fear, um, I don't want to self um, edit because I'm afraid of what people will think of the book. I want to make sure that I can write courageously and write the book that moves in my heart and not be um, so undone by my own worry and my own fears that I produce a book that I don't feel good about. So I have to do that work first um, to make sure that I can be brave before I wade into um, what the next book will be. But hopefully that will be sooner than later. We shall see. I have a lot of time on my hands now because I'm stuck in the house with my kids and my husband like everyone else is. So maybe in the next few months I will, I will begin again. Well, those were the questions I wanted to share with you. And it's been great uh, to have you, you know, help us through that journey of, you know, reading your novel, talking about it, sharing our experiences. Uh, I would like now to pass this along back to Linda um, so that um, she can remind us of uh, the events. Uh, thanking you again, Janine, for joining us and thanking everybody for their interest in the novel and the great questions and the conversation we've been able to have today. Thank you, Monica. Thank con you, Monica. Gusto, con mucho gusto. Mucho gusto, también. Thank you, thank you Monica. Um, and, and our deepest thanks to you, Janine. Um, you know, this was an illuminating and um, um, you're very special to have joined us uh, for this conversation.